You are watching Cold Fusion TV. Hi, welcome to part 2 of the three-part series of the rise and fall of Nokia. Previously, we saw the man who started Nokia, and the circumstances that forced Nokia to become a communications company. After this, we began to see how they started prospering within the industry. In today's episode, we'll look at how they rose to power, and what innovations they brought to the table. Some of them last till this very day. Let's continue. The 1990s were a special time for mobile technology. The general population could keep in contact with each other for the first time. And a lot of this was due to Nokia's diverse range of innovative, indestructible phones that everyone just loved. But at this time, the difference was there was no selfie obsession, Instagram, Facebook, and you didn't even have to charge your phone that often. The 90s was the golden decade for Nokia, as it had now streamlined its focus to mobile phones only. Let me take you through a nostalgic look at Nokia's rise to industry leadership. Even if you're not into technology, it's kind of interesting. I want you to think of this as a company charting brand new territory, paving the way in an infant industry that was to eventually become the world's largest. For the time, the Nokia team had great insight and intuition as you'll soon see. The first milestone arrived in 1992 in the form of the Nokia 1011. This was the world's first GSM digital phone. For those of you wondering, the acronym GSM stands for Global System of Mobile Communications and it is still the standard used today. The first GSM networks were 2G, which were replacing the old analog 1G systems. After this innovation, Nokia really began to find a groove and they showed that they could push the concept of an all-encompassing dual-door mobile phone that was more than just a simple transmitter and receiver connected over a network. They knew, and I mean knew, that the future was all in the software. With adequate, easy to use software, this new phenomena of a portable talking device could be so much more. This revolutionary idea was finally realized in the Nokia 2110, released in 1994, and it was kind of a big deal. At the time, mobile phones were still huge and bulky with large batteries, yet they still had very small, almost unreadable displays. When the sleek device came to market, people were stunned. The 2110 pretty much went all the way. It had address books, missed call and text indicators, and it was the first phone to feature that now familiar Nokia ringtone, which was composed over 100 years ago, by the way. And not only that, it was one of the very first phones to be able to both send and receive text messages. The 2110 was an absolute smash hit and went on to become one of the best-selling phones of all time. And because of this, it pretty much defined the way a business phone should look. But that wasn't all. Nokia was just getting started and the importance of software was fully realized in 1996 with the Nokia 9000 communicator. It took IBM's 1993 concept of the smartphone even further by adding a full QWERTY keyboard, web browsing, email, fax, word processing, and of course the 90s quintessential spreadsheet. The only problem with this device was that it hit the market too early. In many respects, people couldn't relate to the aspect of an all-in-one encompassing phone. The $800 price tag also didn't help. But to Nokia overall, that didn't really matter because by this stage, they were on fire. In 1997, Nokia released the 6110. This was the first phone to ever feature the most legendary mobile game ever made, Snake. The 6110 also had an advanced user interface that was to become the industry standard. It's kind of the same equivalent importance as the home screen on your modern smartphone today. By 1998, Nokia overtook Motorola as the number one phone manufacturer in the world. But during this same year, a significant event occurred that would help shape Nokia's destiny. It was a mobile operating system. You see, Nokia was really into the software side of things and they believed that having an active role in software development could be beneficial for the company. So they got on board with a software called Symbian. Even though Symbian was heavily used by Nokia, it wasn't their sole creation. Symbian originated from Epoch an operating system created in the 1980s. Symbian was actually a major joint venture between Ericsson, Motorola, and Nokia themselves. After this, Symbian split into different platforms for different mobile phone manufacturers. There was a version built by Nokia for Nokia, Samsung, and LG phones, and there was another version for Sony Ericsson phones and Motorola phones. The Symbian operating system was actually quite advanced for the day, but actually later proved to be a real thorn in the flesh for Nokia. There'll be more on Symbian in the next part. Okay, 
back to the story of Nokia and their incredible innovative streak. By 1999, Nokia was absolutely smashing it, and the Nokia 3210 was the bombshell. This phone actually accommodated for consumer consumption with multiple covers. It also featured pre-made two-tone picture messages, such as a happy birthday that could be sent by SMS. It was also very cheap, which for the first time meant that it was available to ultra tech savvy teenagers born in the 1980s. Remember, mobile phones at the time were seen as mum and dad's work communication tool. And for the first time, the 3210 made technology cool and sociable. Nokia had officially reached almost every market, an absolutely incredible feat by any means. In the early 2000s, Nokia just had hit after hit, with phones such as the 5110 in the year 2000 and the 1100 in 2003, again one of the best selling phones of all time. 2002 was a particularly good year for Nokia, as they released the 6650, the world's first 3G phone, and also the 7650, Nokia's first ever camera phone which incidentally was featured in that Tom Cruise movie, Minority Report. I guess the movie directors knew that camera phones were going to be the next big thing. From 2003, Nokia really began to experiment with different designs. And as it turns out, experimentation and winning streaks don't always go together. And hence, Nokia's first major mistake occurred in 2003. A bit of context first. During this year, games in general were pretty hot. The PS2 and Xbox were just hitting their prime time and the Game Boy Advance just blew the portable game market open just the previous year. Nokia wanted in. So what did they end up doing? Well, they ended up taking a slightly revamped LCD panel and modified a phone design to feature directional keys as well as a full phone dialer. And they launched the infamous N-Gage. And just by looking at this picture of it, you can see a few problems. It generally would have been clumsy to use either as a phone or a gaming device, simply because of that design and button layout. Any multi-purpose product has to perform all of the advertised features well, and this just didn't cut it. In late 2004, the US manufacturer Motorola scored a worldwide hit with its very thin Razer flip phone. Nokia got a bit of criticism from its investors, and they were saying that they spent too much time on high-end smartphones, while rivals ate into the lucrative business of selling expensive dumb phones to people around the world. But despite this, in 2005, Nokia phones became so popular that they were the number one digital camera brand worldwide. But it still wasn't enough for Nokia and their management. The market for dumb phones proved to be too attractive, and because of this, Nokia's financial officer, Oli Pekka Kalasvul, took over from the management mindset of Mr. Olia in 2006. The new management merged Nokia's smartphone and basic phone operations. Now it was all about the bottom line. Instead of Nokia leaving basic phones behind and moving ahead, they focused more on the traditional phone. Nokia went backwards. Frankly, this change in management marked the beginning of the end for Nokia's amazing run. In the next episode, we'll see the inside information from previous staff members during Nokia's faltering days. Surprisingly, one of the major reasons for Nokia's fall was from within. Nokia would become plagued with internal company conflicts, which made them very slow in reacting to Apple's release of the iPhone and subsequently Android's release. It's actually pretty interesting to see what went on behind closed doors. Anyway, that marks the end of this episode. Thanks for tuning in and watching. But before I leave, I just want to leave one fun fact. You may have noticed that all the Nokia codes for all their phones never really have the number 4 in it. And that's because in Asian markets, the number 4 is seen as unlucky by some people. So I just thought that was quite interesting. Anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment, thumbs up, and subscribe if you're new. This has been Dagogo and you've been watching Cold Fusion. I'll catch you again soon for the next video. Have a good one, guys. Cheers. Cold Fusion. It's new thinking.